Today in the news, Zen 4 got spotted and AMD's plan is working. What's up guys, I'm Snows and this is your boot sequence. But first, today's sponsor, Morning Brew. In the morning, do you aimlessly go through your social media to try and find something interesting, but end up with mostly dry and sometimes boring articles? Well, in the last couple of weeks, I started using Morning Brew. No, it's not a coffee. It's a free daily newsletter I get every morning that only takes five minutes to read and catches me up on business, finance, and tech. It's pretty witty too. Last week, I found out that LinkedIn has ghostwriters that get paid more in an hour than me in two weeks. So. Uh, Help me out here and go subscribe to Morning Brew for free by using morningbrewdaily.com slash boot sequence or by clicking the link in the description down below. It takes less than 15 seconds, so seriously, help me out here. Sign up. Let's get started with AMD. The last time AMD commented on the Zen 4 lineup of CPUs, we got this, the ultimate processors for gaming rigs. Now, the focus on that slide was definitely shifted towards mobile processors. We got an entirely new fork for the laptop segment called Dragon Range, which focuses on APUs with higher wattages. AMD did touch on Zen 4 for desktop CPUs, but not much. All we have is Raphael coming this year and the technologies that support it, which we already knew about. Now we're finally starting to get leaks from the people who are currently testing these Raphael Ryzen 7000 CPUs. The leak comes from openbenchmarking.org and it reveals some pretty juicy info. First, we can see that the motherboard is called Splinter-RPL, but that's probably just kind of like how B450 was called Promontory. Then looking at the specs of the CPU, we can tell that this engineering sample is an 8-core 16-thread one. What's really impressive is the clock speed here. This sample is at 5.21 gigahertz, over 5 gigahertz and by quite a lot honestly. It really looks like AMD has figured out clock speeds because they were struggling for most of these Zen architectures. Now I know that this 5.21 isn't necessarily all core, actually it's probably not, but with the advances in Zen 2 and Zen 3, the difference between the highest clock core and the lowest clock core is a lot less steep than it used to be. Oh, and look at this. We can now confirm that Ryzen 7000 will be the first non-G variant of a desktop CPU to have integrated graphics. Here, you can can see that this CPU has GFX 1036 as its graphics core. Now, I don't want to bore you with the details, but essentially the GFX 10 here is RDNA 2, so essentially the equivalent of the RX 6000 family. That's not to say that it's going to have good graphics though, no way. We've known for a while that these graphics are just something to have audio and video out on your computer, kind of like the IGP in Intel's non-F line of CPUs. That's why you can see Rembrandt here in the audio section, because it's an RDNA 2 GPU. And if you're looking for something that can game, well, you'll have to wait at least a year before AMD cracks open the 7000G SKUs with Dragon Range. So yeah, Ryzen 7000's engineering system sample is looking great with its 5 gigahertz plus and it can really only go up from here. I can't wait till the end of this year. Moving on, today marks the day of the first game to support AMD's FidelityFX Super Resolution 2.0. Now, as is, FSR 1.0 was not really comparable to other technologies such as DLSS, but this new version is supposed to improve things greatly. And thanks to Deathloop having all three technologies, so FSR 1, 2, and NVIDIA DLSS, we have here from Tech Power Up our first look at the differences. As you might already know, FSR 2.0 is now a temporal scaler, which can sometimes bring in some issues like ghosting. Well, thanks to the disocclusion detection, AMD is actually able to kind of go around this. Now, they haven't completely fixed the ghosting that comes with temporal upscaling, but they did reduce it greatly. They also lock thin features to make the image look better when you have things like gates far off in the distance or fences or power lines. This was a big issue with uh, FSR 1.0 and DLSS 1.0, in fact. I remember Steve from Gamers Nexus showing us on Final Fantasy the gate that just didn't stop flickering. Anyways, let's skip over to the actual image quality comparison. Here, we have a scene in Deathloop at 1440p with both FSR and DLSS in quality mode. If you look at the gun that uh, the person is currently holding, you can see that DLSS actually has a bit of a loss in terms of details, whereas FSR really brings that up. It's not a terribly huge difference, but 
but it's still there. And here we have another scene, this time at 4K, with both technologies at quality modes. As you can see, the ball here seems to be a little bit more realistic with FSR. It seems like DLSS applies some kind of over sharpening to it, which doesn't make it look too good. You can also see here the wires on the balloons look a little bit staggered on DLSS, but they look better with FSR. With the gun, we see the same scenario as before, where the staggeredness on DLSS is completely fixed on FSR. Now, keep in mind, so far at this quality setting, FSR 2.0 has actually been getting less FPS than DLSS. It's marginal, but it's still the case. You can see here just as proof, DLSS is consistently getting better performance than FSR. So what's your take on this? I know DLSS has been touted as the greatest upscaling technology for a long time, but there are fundamental differences between how both technologies work. In fact, I'm patiently waiting for Digital Foundry to release their FSR comparison video. I know Alex tweeted out on this and he said that uh, there is some take and there is some give, but that there are interesting differences. So that's gonna be a cool video to watch. I would highly recommend you watch it too. And lastly, it looks like the fine wine is back with AMD. Their latest beta drivers actually have huge improvements for DirectX 11 games. As you can see here, the improvements range from 3% all the way up to 17% when talking about Total War Saga. And that's not it. Crisis Remastered is up to 24% faster. That's insane for one driver to the other. That's not for the first driver release for that game up to now. That's an even bigger difference. Now, of course, games like Crisis Remastered have had updates which would probably increase the performance on other GPUs like for Nvidia's. But still, performance coming directly from a driver that's always good. Anyways, guys, that is pretty much it for today's catch up. Hopefully you've enjoyed. Drop a like if you liked it, a comment if you want to talk about today's stories. As usual, you can click on the side right here to uh, see the latest video or to uh, subscribe to the channel. Stay frosty, my dudes, and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.